So if you've joined us for any length of time over the last couple of weeks, we've been in a Bible study series of why do bad things happen to good people? Why do we suffer? Why do the Christians suffer? Why do we have to go through things? We've looked at uh, a study of Paul last week. Week before that, we looked at Esther and Ruth and Naomi. We even did a study on Joseph. And in each of those stories, and I'll share a little bit more here in a moment, there was a lesson, multiple different lessons throughout. But the main lesson that we have to get from all of this is that God is in control and he gets all the glory, all of it. Everything that happens in our lives, somewhere down the line, he's glorified and you get a blessing. Doesn't feel like it, doesn't seem like it. The suffering sometimes seems too much. I'm gonna share with you today from the book of Jeremiah, how the Lord is still in control of everything that goes on in our lives, okay? So turn to Jeremiah chapter 29, and I'm gonna come from Jeremiah 29 and Jeremiah 33. So get your Bibles out, get your highlighters out, get your, your pen and pad out, and uh, let me see if I can make this more viewable so you guys can see my, my full face. I apologize about that. Here we go. How about that? So Jeremiah 29, it starts with the Israelites being exiled to Babylon. Everybody remembers King Nebuchadnezzar. He took over, not because of anything that he was doing as much as it was God who was explaining and showing the children of Israel that they failed. They, they did not follow through on obeying God and the commands. And so he allowed, he allowed Nebuchadnezzar, that's important. He allowed Nebuchadnezzar to take over Israel. He exiled them, meaning he took them out of their land and sent them to Babylonia. It was in Babylonia that they began this, this pilgrimage, this journey of being slaves and servants in a, in a distant land. They were distant from the very thing that they knew. They were distant from the, the very uh, identity that they had in their God. There was nothing that was familiar to them. The language was different. The customs, the lifestyle was different. It was unfamiliar territory in this journey. And so Jeremiah was one of the prophets that lived during that time. He was known as the weeping prophet, the prophet who cried a lot to the Lord, the, the prophet who cried out to God on behalf of friends, family members, the people of God. So in this exile, there was false prophets. I mean, J Jeremiah chapter 29, uh, false prophets were telling everybody, this won't last long. You, you're going to get out of this soon. We, we won't be here for much longer. Our captivity is, is just temporary. The Lord actually spoke to Jeremiah in chapter 29 and said, do not listen to the false prophets. There are people telling you things that aren't true. Your struggle is going to be a little bit longer. You, you, we're going to be here for a while. We need to settle in. Put your seatbelts on. Get your helmets. We're going to be here for a while. The Lord told Jeremiah to tell the people that they're going to be there for 70 years. And in that 70 years, you need to go ahead and get comfortable. Build homes. Plant gardens. Get used to being in this foreign land. But after 70 years, I'm going, to, I'm going to take you out. I'm going to bring you out. And when I bring you out, you go back home and you can rebuild the temple. 70 years. Can you imagine the person who was in their 30s and 40s and when they heard the word 70 years probably said to themselves, I'll never see home again. I'll never get the opportunity to, to, to raise my grandkids back at home. I'll never get to go back to where we, where we raised family. Now, if you were younger, if you were in your 20s or maybe even your teens, early 30s, 70 years was still distant, but there was hope. Think about this. Come on, let's put ourselves in the shoes of this group of people. They are told by God, you're not getting out of this anytime soon. This struggle, this trial, this exile, this separation, this feeling in this, of anxiety and depression that's overcoming you, I want you to settle. There's a reason for this. I need you to, to grow in your character, grow in your strength. Can you imagine being in your upper 50s or 60s and being told that you won't go home for 70 years? I can understand right now as the Lord is teaching us this, why I would have itchy ears for false prophets. Oh, I would love to hear somebody tell me good news. I would love for somebody to tell me something that gives me hope about tomorrow because I want to get out of this thing. I'm not waiting 70 years. I, I have no desire to stay in this situation this long. I'm better than this. We're better than this. So yes, other prophets, what, I need a second opinion. Does anyone else want to prophesy to me? Jeremiah is talking about 70 years. Does anyone else want to give me a word? And Jeremiah had to say, listen, I'm the official mouthpiece for God. Settle in. Now, the good news about this story is that at the end of the 70 years, they actually was, they were released. Another king came in, Cyrus. You remember Cyrus from the Esther story. The Persian 
country battled the Babylonian country, they went to war and Persia won. Persia struck down Nebuchadnezzar and that entire uh, army and they took control of the people. Yeah, this is all in the Bible. It's all connected. And they did go home after 70 years. God's promises were fulfilled. God didn't lie. He didn't make a mistake. He knew exactly what he was doing in that 70 years. Now, there were probably some people who didn't make it, like in the story of, of, of Moses and the children of Israel. Everyone didn't make it, but God's promise was still God's promise. And as I mentioned before, many times the promise isn't for you. It's for another generation to grow and learn and be strengthened from what you as an ancestor, you are a living ancestor. You are a living ancestor. You are a living ancestor in this story. And you get to pass on wisdom and knowledge to the next group. God did not fail. He did not make a mistake. He's not short in his promises. He knows what he's doing. It's in this chapter that we all quote the, the, the famous verse, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. Let's be real for just a moment. Let's get into this. If I'm already 48 and I'm not going home till the 70 year mark, how is that a future? How is that hope? If, if, if everything that I'm hoping for won't even happen in my lifetime, what's the point? Why? Jeremiah, before he got to this chapter, actually said something that we all have, have voiced. Why is everybody around me prospering? Why, why, do, why do the Babylonians get to win? When is it my turn to win? Have you ever have you ever asked that question? Have you ever got to a point in your walk, your journey, where it looks like everybody else is succeeding except for you? And you're stuck in this exile? You're stuck separated? We've all been there. I, I've been there. I, I've been there so many times that I, I've been just like every prophet and every preacher in the Bible. And <clears throat> excuse me, let me let you know that we're not alone. So Jeremiah says, Jeremiah 12 and 1, why do the wicked succeed? Why does all their treachery thrive? This was a preacher. This was a preacher asking God. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I got a, I got a question for you, God. Why do you let the wicked win? Habakkuk said the same thing in Habakkuk 1 and 13. Why do you remain so silent when the wicked devour us? But why? Another preacher, another prophet of God questioning God as to why do we have to suffer? King David said it. Psalm 73, for I was envious of the arrogant as I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Behold, such are the wicked. They are always at ease and they increase in their riches. Surely in vain I've cleansed my heart and washed my hands in innocence. Why? David said pretty much in so many words, I'm kind of jealous if I was real. If I, if I could be totally honest, I'm looking at everyone else prosper. I'm seeing everyone else getting married. I'm seeing everyone else get promotions. Everyone else get cars and houses and, and enjoy their kids. I see everyone else with good health. I see everyone else prospering in their, their businesses and their side hustles. I see everyone else doing well. I'm kind of jealous a little bit, Lord. I just, I just want one thing to go right. Job said it. Why do the wicked still live? I lost my entire family, Job said. I lost my business. Yet the wicked can just do whatever they want. Malachi. So now we call the arrogant blessed? Yeah, that's how it's starting to look, Lord. It looks like you're starting to bless the, the, those who are prideful. Not only are the doers of wickedness built up, they also test you. You ever feel that way? These are the preachers of God. David was a man after God's own heart, and he felt like God might not have everything in order, that perhaps maybe we could, we could question his, his righteousness, his judgment. Why do good things happen to good people like us? So in the Esther story, just to recap, and I'm going to give us some more scripture. Here's what we learned from Esther. Suffering was a setup for future favor. To be in the right place at the right time for such a time as this. Esther showed us quiet humility. They didn't even know she existed. She had such a humble presence. In the Joseph story. We, we were taught that after 17 years and maybe even 37 years down the road, again, it was a setup. God knew the famine was going to happen when Joseph was born. Wait, what we learned from that story was that God had a plan 40 years in the making. Joseph didn't understand it at all. In prison, brothers tried to murder him. He was trafficked as a 17-year-old. But God saw that there was a need 
40 years from now, things had to be in perfect order for it to happen. Joseph was humble all throughout that story. Humble. Ruth gave us a lesson in faithfulness and also being humble. She, she showed us what mercy looks like. She could have done her own thing. She could win her own way, but she was consistent. She was a hard worker. She thought of others before herself. She wasn't arrogant and she was humble. We all know Paul's story. Went through a list of scriptures last week about Paul. Paul has given us some of the best scriptures in the New Testament in our Christian walk. You know what Paul learned through all his trials and circumstance? To stay humble, to be content, not be arrogant, not feel like you deserve something. Paul remained appreciative of all his struggles. He even went on to say that when you are weak, you're actually strong. And when you're suffering, it's actually for the glory of God. You should actually rejoice. And he said, I'll say it again. Rejoice. So in the lesson so far, for anyone that's asking, why are we going through the things we're going through? I thought we were Christians. I'm here to tell you that suffering is a part of life. Suffering is a part of the Christian life. Let me put it that way. We have so many biblical examples of the Christian, the righteous, the, the chosen of God going through suffering. If anyone's ever told you that this was an easy life, it's not. It's not. N not when you have an anointing on your life because the devil doesn't want you to prosper. And I'm going to be very careful to, to not point fingers at different theologies and doctrines and denominations. But my word teaches us, and I'm going to give you a scripture here tonight, that if you are Christian, you need to prepare yourself. Now, he, he'll give you the strength to get through everything as we're getting ready to find out. He's going to make a way for you and your family. But you can't just go tell uh, money and prosperity to come to you. It doesn't work that way. We can definitely pray against demons and devils and cast off imaginations and everything that sets itself up against God. But, but be very careful trying to tell God what to do. 2 Timothy 3 and 12. This is one of your scriptures for tonight. 2 Timothy 3 and 12. You can write this one down. Let me see here. Indeed, all who desire to live godly. Do you desire to live godly? Well, if you desire to live godly, you will be persecuted. Why did Paul tell Timothy that? Because Paul had lived a full Christian life after his conversion being persecuted. This, this lets us know as Christians. Paul the writer of the New Testament said, if you are going to live godly, be prepared. Romans 8 and 17, another one of Paul's words. Now, if we are children and heirs to what Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was prophesied through Christ Jesus, being co-heirs with Christ, then indeed we shall share in his sufferings so that he can get the glory. Philippians 1 29, and I'll put these in the chat here in a moment. Or if someone can put them in the chat for me. Thank you, Ebony. Ebony is already thinking there for me. Romans 8 and 17 was the previous scripture. This is Bible study tonight. I'm not going to preach to you. We're, we're looking at the Bible. Philippians 1 and 29. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but to also suffer with him. Wait, wait, wait. Where's the prosperity? Where's all the blessings? Where's all the goodness and the happiness that we talk about? Peter jumps on in the story or in the conversation. 1 Peter 4, 12 and 13 reads, Dear friends, friends, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeals that have come to test you as though something strange is happening. Why has everything happened to me? If it's not one thing, it's something else. Paul said, I mean, Peter said, don't, don't be surprised. But he says rejoice as participants in the suffering of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. Wow, wow. Jesus' brother jumps in on, this, on, the, on the bandwagon. He said, consider it, this is James chapter 1, 2 and 4. James chapter 1, 2 and 4. Consider it pure joy. Time out. Time. Got to call the coaches time out. Consider what joy? Do you know what I've been through? Do you know what I'm dealing with? Do you know the anguish and the, the heartache I've had to go through? There is no joy in dealing with pain and suffering and trials and loss. He said, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. There's some stick to it that comes from going through a trial. There's some humbleness that comes with going through a trial. He said, let, let that stick to it that perseverance, finish its work so that you may be mature and complete. Let me stop right here and teach. And I'm not going to get ahead of myself, but I am. 
some of the trials, some of the things that God has put you through, that he's allowed you to go through. So, yeah, some of the stuff that hurts really, really bad. It's to strengthen you, your character, to humble you. If, if you're not willing to be humbled, it may go on for a little bit longer. That's biblical. We have biblical examples of multiple people who did not get the lesson. They were not uh, mature in their understanding of who Christ was, and they stayed in their situation, children of Israel. Children of Israel again with Moses in this story with the exile, 70 years. God knew that they would backslide. He knew that they wouldn't repent. He knew that they wouldn't be humble. Let me finish reading this. Because the testing of your faith produces perseverance, let perseverance finish its work. No, I don't want to be finished with it. I want to be done now. So you can be mature, complete, not lacking anything. Can you find joy in your trials? Who can get a bad report from the doctor and say, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Who can get bad news from their job and get laid off and say, well, praise God. Hallelujah. He must have something better for me. Get served with divorce pray papers. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I have full joy in Jesus. That's something you got to learn to do. Because the, 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 the initial emotion when you find out bad news is to start thinking the worst, start preparing for the worst, start getting yourself prepared emotionally and mentally for what's next. Jesus' brother said, you, you need to find some joy in your trial. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 4. Praise be to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our troubles. Time out again. Let's study this scripture. There are times I do not feel comforted, Lord. Come on, be honest. Am I the only one willing to talk about this tonight? There are times that in my trouble, I don't feel comfort. I don't feel the Holy Spirit. So what, is, what are you talking about, Paul, that he comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can comfort those in trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God? Here's what I've learned. I've learned that there's a, there's a humbleness. I keep using this word tonight. There's a humbleness that comes for you to receive comfort. It's something about you mourning, something about you being lowly, poor in spirit, that the Holy Spirit can then work on you. The arrogance, the pride, the trying to figure it out on your own, the, the I'm going to pay you back spirit, the bitter spirit, the Holy Spirit can't work with any of that. The, 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 the ideal that you somehow can fix this yourself, or God owes you an answer, or I just can't handle this right now, I'm upset with God. Some of you have been upset with God, been upset with the church. God can't allow the Holy Spirit to do anything with that. You have to come to him humble. John 16 and 33, Jesus said, wait, 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 wait. So Paul talked about it. Timothy, we knew, talked about it because Paul told Timothy to tell other people that you're going to suffer. Peter talked about it. Jesus' brother James talked about it. And Jesus says this in John 16, 33. I've told you these things so that in me, Jesus, you can have some peace. In this world, Jesus said, you will have troubles. You will have trials. You will have tribulations. Jesus said that. He said, you will. He said, but take heart. Take courage. Be encouraged in your heart, in your center, in your emotions. Be uplifted. Be motivated. Because I've overcome the world. I've already, I've already seen how the world is going to end. I've already seen how your world uh, transpires. I've overcome your world. Oh, that's a good word for somebody tonight in this Bible study. John 16, 33. Everything that's happening in your world. Everything that's happening in your atmosphere. Everything that, that you think is going on in your sphere. He said, I've already overcome it. I've overcome your trials. I've overcome your, your situations, your loss, your mishaps, your misunderstandings, all your skirmishes and fights, your pain, your loss. I have overcome the world. We're in the world. He said he's overcome the world. So that means somewhere in there, he's acknowledging the fact that as followers in him, we can have peace. So this, this is what I'm going to try to teach tonight because that's I think that's the rub. I think that's where we, we get stuck. We get stuck right there in the, uh, I'm an overcomer. I'm more than a conqueror. All things work together for the good, but it doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel good to see everybody else prospering. I'm in this exile land and everybody is doing their thing and I feel lost. I, I, I feel disconnected from the very thing that I think should be right. Is this helping tonight? I got some more. Thank you guys. Babe, I see you on here for uh, <coughs> putting these scriptures in the chat. Any questions real quick before I continue? Let me pause. Let me pause and see if there's any questions about anything I've read so far. 
any comments or questions around anything I've shared. Yes, Jamie. Yes, ma'am. Any thoughts? Should I continue? Praise God. All right. So here's the next piece I kind of want to hit on. Your suffering, your trials, the bad things that happen to you, it's for your character. Let me write that down somewhere. Put that on a sticky, put it in your phone. God is all about your character. Say that. It's, it's about my character. Your character is what's going to maintain your blessing. All the things that you think you want, all the things you desire, all the things that you have in your heart that you want to be free of or get filled with, until your character is strong enough to handle the other things that are coming in the future, God may may continue to build. He may continue to mold. See, the, the blessing is of the blessed future of Christ. That's, that's the real goal. It's not houses and cars and promotions and how I look and how I feel. It, it's... It's the character that I need to have when I when I enter heaven. I got to have a mindset of suffering. I got to have a mindset of humbleness that will help me enter the gates. I, I believe that he's Christ. I believe he's my savior. Now I have to walk out my salvation. I have to walk by faith. I have to have works along with my faith. And a part of the work is to humble yourself, to have the mind of Christ. Your, your walk is about faith and some suffering. His, his righteousness not material blessings, not always physical blessings. Humility is a key thing in your suffering. Why do bad things happen to us? Humility. Why am I going through what I'm, I'm going through? God wants to humble you. Why do I have to deal with this? Because he, you're, you're, you're a piece of, you're, you're a work in progress. You, you are somebody he's chiseling and making sure looks just right before he can use you or send you out or take you to that next level. See, your, your story, every story we've looked at should have a an element or a couple of chapters around humility. If you can't tell your story without some humility, then you're probably going to be there for a little bit longer. Everyone was humbled in their trial. Esther, humble. Paul, humble. Job, humble. Joseph, humble. Ruth and Mara, humble. Remember Daniel in the lion's den? Humbled. If this is my end, this is my end. Abraham, humble. Mary and Martha, humble. I can see them sweeping the house right now and try to get things together knowing Jesus did not come. Humbled. The evidence of your faith is not tongues. The evidence of your faith is not laying on of hands and singing in the choir. The evidence of your faith is a humble, peaceful heart. It's not happiness. It's holiness. It's a holy contentment. It's a holy contentment. Write that down. My faith should be a holy, humble contentment. Yeah. If, if God doesn't do anything else for me, praise the Lord. I'll shout all the way to my grave. If the Lord doesn't do another thing for me, I am grateful for his salvation and his mercy. Let me say that again. The evidence of your faith is a humble, peaceful heart not happiness. It's holiness and humble contentment. See, happiness can be deceiving because we have this illusion that if I can just obtain this status, if I can obtain this degree, if I can get this promotion, if I can get this many likes on Facebook, if I can get this you know, type of material things, I've made it. If I can get this look, if I can get this much money in my bank account, or if my health ever gets to this level right here, boy, if I can buy that home in that neighborhood, then my life is on track. Don't be deceived. Do you know that's exactly what Satan offered Christ? You can have everything. You can have everything. How you look, you can be famous, you want money, you want a career. I'll give you everything. Jesus took the humble route. He said, no, I'm good. We get this deception that the devil has put out there that you must be here by the age of 40. He's put these thoughts in your mind. You must be here by 50 and then you've arrived. But if you hadn't hit this, then you must not be anybody. Then we start judging our life and comparing our lives to other people. We look at what other people have, how other people look, what other people possess. And it, it causes some distraction. It causes some disruption. It causes some deception. It causes a, an illusion, a manipulation. What if, stay with me here. What if God had another plan for your life? What if that wasn't what God wanted for you by 40? 
What, what if God did not desire for you to get to where you thought you were going to get by 50 and 60? What, what if God knew, watch this, a better plan to direct your path? Let, let that marinate. What if the King of King and the Lord of Lords who created everybody and everything and has this a uh, uh, magnificent plan for everybody's lives moving together at certain places and intervals. Just what if he knew better than you? Hmm. But I thought the Lord said he'd give me the desires of my heart. I don't even have time to go and, and really break that down for you. The short version of that is he'll give you the desires that he put into your heart, a humbled heart, a humbled heart that says, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. Let your kingdom come, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, in earth, in these earthly vessels, just as you've desired. And once I hear the Holy Spirit tell me what it is you want me to do, then I'll carry out your purpose. But we have already written down our, our action plans, our goals, our targets. We've put vision boards up, and there's nothing wrong with any of that. Uh, uh, people without a vision will perish. But you have to be open to, to the Lord's leading. And if the Lord say, make a left, cross that off the list, you're not going over here, that's not in the plans. Are you willing to humble yourself? Are you willing to humble yourself before the mighty presence of God and his will? Perhaps some of the suffering we're going through is because God is trying to teach us a lesson in humility and holiness, not happiness. I don't have all the things I want. I don't. I, there's some things that I'm just not. And God is saying, what if I was actually the one doing this? We'll blame Satan. And sometimes the devil tries to rear his ugly head. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But do you know that the Lord allowed Satan to do that? Did you notice my, my servant Job? Did you notice Job over there? What if God was the one that told Satan it's okay because it's not going to kill him? 70 years. He told them, prepare. Settle in. This is, this is your situation because I'm getting ready to teach you something. And again, that's the rub. That's when we begin to get frustrated, right? Am I, am I, am I on to something tonight? Is that where we get disgruntled? We start blaming other people. We blame our spouse. We blame mom and daddy because they didn't do right. We blame the boss. We blame the job. And what if God was the one who allowed the exile? What if? My wife and I play this game. Babe, we play this game every so often. We played it a lot when we first got married. We would look into each other's eyes and say, tell me what I'm thinking. What, what am I thinking right now? She'd probably get it right two out of, you know, three times, two out of four times. I would I would miss, I'd maybe get it right one out of five. I mean, you're thinking about a pair of shoes. You're thinking about a new purse. You're thinking about me cleaning the kitchen. And I'd be off. And she's like, no, I'm just thinking that I love you. And, you know, it was something so simple. I could not figure out what she was thinking. Have you ever played that with somebody? You, Ebony said, I remember those days. My wife is laughing. <laughs> I, I cannot get in my wife's head. I cannot even figure out half the time in 24 years of marriage, you know, I'm still learning to navigate, to be a perfect husband, to be the best husband, right? She's learning to be the wife and we're still figuring each other out. I don't know what's in her head. How do you know what's in God's head? What's God thinking? God is saying, tell me what I'm thinking. Tell me what I think the plan is for you. No, 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 God, I don't want to hear your plan. Here's what my plan is. I want to work for Nike. I want to make $200,000 a year. I want to travel the globe. I want to have three kids and a picket fence and a nice bricked home. And by the age of 50, I want to have season tickets to the Thunder game. And by the time I hit 60, I want to have a million and a half in my 401k. And by the time I hit 65, Lord, I'd love to have five grandbabies and great Thanksgivings and Christmases. And God is saying, but what am I thinking? What am I thinking? Oh, I hope this is ministering to somebody tonight. Stacy, that's the that's every situation I look at self and say, God, what are you trying to teach me? Yes, Stacy. Even in your situation, Stacy, that you're going through, we're praying for you, sis, with the cancer. We believe that God is going to help you make the right decision. And that you this is still a part of his plan. This is for you tonight, Stacy and Brian. It's for everybody. What if God knew, Stacy, in advance, that he had to shape your thoughts, shape your emotions, get you to a place of humbleness he knew exactly what trial would bring you to where he needed you to go how long it would take how far he could take you without actually breaking you see job never broke mara asked uh, ruth uh walked with with uh, naomi she changed her name but she never broke 
D David got to a point where he was frustrated. Why is everyone after me? But he never broke. The fact that you're here right now, everybody, the, the fact that you hadn't taken your life or done something drastic lets me know that you haven't broke, that his spirit is with you. His strength is with you. Yeah, it gets hard. It gets challenging. You don't understand why, but you haven't broke because his thoughts for you are way into the future and there's more in store. And that's our hope. Isaiah 58, 8 and 9. Isaiah 58, 8 and 9. He said, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. My plans aren't your plans. You don't even know what I'm thinking. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. See, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than the ways of your thoughts. Romans 11, 33. Romans 11, 33. Write that one down. Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments, his past beyond tracing out. You can't even trace God's plans. You can't even get close to thinking what you think God wants for you. You might have an idea of what you want, but what if, what if, what if, that's the question tonight. What if God is doing something so different in your life for a greater purpose than money in the bank, a greater purpose than a promotion in a career, a greater purpose than having grandbabies and grandkids in a big house, what, a greater purpose than being healed of all your disease. What if there was a greater purpose that you have no idea is out there? 70 years, 70 years, they were in that exile. 1 Corinthians 2 and 11, Jamie's mom made it. Hi, Miss Jamie's mom. Thank you for joining us. We've been praying for you. We believe God is in the, in the business of healing. So thank you for joining us tonight. Write this scripture down, everybody. 1 Corinthians 2 and 11. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? That's the game my wife and I used to play. It's actually in the scripture. 1 Corinthians 2 and 11. Who? You don't know my life. You don't know what I'm thinking right now. So in the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. Job 11, 7. Job 11, 7. This is Bible study tonight. If you came for something else, uh, you come back and scroll later. We are getting into scripture because it's the word of God that strengthens us. Job 11 and 7 says, can you fathom the mysteries of God? Can you probe the limits of the Almighty? No. He's the creator of all things. He created every star in the sky and all we do is look at him. He actually created the star. He knows what's existing inside of each star. He knows the elements and the materials that make up every star in the sky. And all we do is look at him. And you're going to tell me that you know better than him that for what's happening in your life? Psalms 147, 5. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding has no limits. Your understanding has limits. Your brain can only handle so much. Even if you studied all day, all night, there's, there's only 24 hours in a day. You, you will only learn so much. You can't remember the entire encyclopedia, uh, the Britannica. I don't know if they even make that anymore. Maybe it's the Wikipedia. You can't even put your mind on every possible major there is in college. Your, your mind is limited in its approach. Some people can get three or four master degrees and two PhDs, but they're limited. They cannot span every subject there is. You're limited. Who are you? God says, I'm unlimited in my thoughts. I know everything. I know what's going on in your life. First Corinthians 2 and 9. This is one of my favorites. I has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has the heart conceived or imagined what God has in store for us. Your, your, your plans are just plans until the Lord decides to do something with those plans. Your trials, your situations, your frustrations, the sickness, the disease, the loss, the hurt, Everything you've gone through, what if God is the one behind it all? Saying this is intentional, this is purposeful, this, this is what I'm using to build character and perseverance. I'm using your situations, your trials, your sufferings for future generations, your legacy, your living legacy for, for those that will come behind you and read your work, understand your story, you will be a testimony some of you are saying right now, Ken, and we heard this this morning in prayer, I, I'm at that breaking point. I don't think I can take anymore. I can't take another uh, thing in my house breaking down. I can't take any more bad news. I can't take one more fight, one more argument. I can't take one more bill being late. I, I can't take one more diagnosis or prognosis or bad report from the doctor. I, can, I just can't take any more. Why is this stuff happening to me? I thought God loved me. I thought he was for me. 
I thought he'd never leave me nor forsake me. I would also probably say you're at the blessing point. If you've gone through all of that, you're probably to that point exactly where he needs you. Humbled, ready to give up, ready to say, I don't care anymore, Lord, do whatever you want to do. Not an, I don't care, I don't want to be here, but I have no more ambition for my life. I have no more prideful intentions of what I'd like to do. I just simply want to be where Jesus is at. That, that's important to understand in this Bible lesson. He was very clear with the people in, in of Israel, exiled to Babylon. You're going to be here for a while. Get comfortable. I, I have you here for a reason. So you can get to a point where you're not trying to make plans back home in Israel, trying to rebuild your home. I need you at a place where you understand. I just, I just need the presence of God. I have no more prideful intentions. I'm, I don't want to do anything on my own. <laughs> Man, I hope this is hope. I, hope. I really hope this is helping tonight. Your struggle, your suffering, your pain. God can only use the humble. Write that down. God can only use the humble. He can only use the humble. He can only use a broken spirit. He can only use those who've truly given up self opinions thoughts concerns you've given it up your struggle is helping you get to that point psalms 51 17 this is still bible study here we go write this down yeah god can only use the humble psalms 51 17 the sacrifices of god are a broken spirit a broken and contrite heart god you will not despise remember david said that he comes to god broken, contrite, repentant, lowly. Isaiah 57, 15. For this is what the high exalted one says. He who lives forever, whose name is holy. He said, I will dwell in a high and holy place, but also I will dwell with the contrite and the lowly of spirit in order to revive the spirit of the lowly, to revive the heart of the contrite. That word contrite just means to repent, to relent, to stop, to give up, to surrender, to not want anything other than what the other person wants. Have you ever been in a situation with somebody and you're like, you know, fine, just fine, what, fine, whatever, whatever you say, whatever you want to do, just that's fine with me. There's a humbleness. There's another layer of that where you truly say, I really don't. I mean, it really doesn't matter to me. I just want to make sure that you're, you're taken care of and it's whatever you want. That's what God is looking for. We don't say that. We don't say, Lord, I really don't care what my career is. If, Lord, if this is where you want me to stay for the rest of my life, I'm, I'm fine with it. Lord, if this is the disease that I have to have in my body, I'm, I'm, we don't say that. We got to get to a place of brokenness. Psalms 34, 18, oh, I know this is so opposite of what a lot of church doctrine preaches. I, listen, let me be clear. I still believe in healing. I still believe in the power of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit. I absolutely believe that the, 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 the miracles still happen. But we're specifically teaching tonight about your struggle and your suffering when God has ordained it, when God has placed suffering and loss and hurt in your life for something greater than, than the moment. Psalms 34, 18, the Lord is near the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Until you're crushed in spirit, he can't save you. Isaiah 66 and 2, for my hand made all these things thus all these things came into being declares the lord but to this one i will look to him who is humble and contrite who trembles at my words psalms 147 and 3 he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds second corinthians 7 and 10 this is bible study tonight second corinthians 7 and 10 for the sorrow that is according to the will of god produces a repentance without regret leading to salvation but the sorrow of the world produces death what paul is saying right there is that when we get to a point where we truly get to we say lord i i relent I'm, i repent without regret like i'm not ashamed to tell anybody my issues i'm not ashamed to tell people what i'm going through i just want the salvation i'll do whatever i need to do to get to you isaiah 53 and 3 he was despised and forsaken by men. Isaiah's prophesying about the Messiah. Isaiah's prophesying about Christ, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised. 
and we did not esteem him. Do you ever feel despised? Praise the Lord. You ever feel like, man, I just, I just need to hide my face. I don't even want to be here. Praise the Lord. Are you acquainted with grief? Because Christ was acquainted with grief. Are you, are you a man or woman of sorrows? Because Christ was a man of sorrows. I hope this is helping tonight, Lord. This is what you gave me to teach. Why do, why do we go through the things we go through? Maybe God is doing something in your life. Maybe this was intentional. When, when you've gotten to the point <clears throat> where you say, listen, if this is what the Lord wants for me, this is how God wants me to be, praise God. When you get to that point, <clears throat> you've arrived. I can tell you, you've arrived. When you mean it in your spirit, that you don't even care anymore. You don't care about your career. You don't care about your health. You don't care about how much money is in the bank. You don't care what kind of home you get. You get to a point where you are truly at the mercies of God and say, you know what? This is what God wants for me. Praise. Can you say praise God in your situation? The end goal is, <clears throat> is not just to have a good life on earth. The end goal is not to have happiness on earth. Oh, I'm teaching tonight. The end goal is to be ready to spend eternity with YHWH on the new earth. Let me say that again. Someone needs to write that one down. The end goal is not to have a good life on this earth. The, the end goal is to be ready to spend eternity with him on the new earth. We'll only be in heaven for a little bit of time. The fertility of, of our eternity will be the new earth, the new Jerusalem. Your love of God is measured by your eternal life, not your earthly life. Peace, love, joy, hope. Those are the things that he's trying to build in us, in our character. So when we get to heaven, because that's all it's going to be. We won't have jobs. Not about the health. We'll have a new body. It won't be about homes and money in heaven. But if that's all you're worried about down here, perhaps the Lord is continuing to, to, to strengthen us and, and teach us. <laughs> Let me pause for some questions or comments. I got some more. I'm going to go ahead and tell you now, babe, I'm going to be a little bit long tonight. We're not going to stop right at eight because I got a little bit more to share. I mean, see what questions or comments we have in the chat. And I'm going to continue my final few points here in this Bible study. Is this helping you tonight? Is this helping you understand your struggle, why you suffer, why we experience loss? God might be behind it. He He's up to something bigger. Can, can you be encouraged tonight to know that it's, it's not about the things here on earth, but that it's about preparing us for eternal, like 70 years from now. Think about what he told Jeremiah to tell the people. You're going to be, you're going to be free in 70 years. Yeah, you're going you're gonna to experience something far greater years from now. And, and it's going to be way better than what it is now. Hallelujah. Mary Lou, thank you for putting that in the chat. The end goal is to be ready to spend eternity with him on the new earth. That's that's the word. Has, Miss Haskins says he's helping me so much. Thank you, Lord. All right. Any other questions, comments? This Bible study, you, we, we can dialogue tonight. Let me go over to Facebook real quick and see if we have any thoughts, opinions. Sister Pippin, are you good so far? All right. I'm going to continue. I got about maybe eight more points and I'm going to be finished here. This is a series that we've done the last five weeks called Why Do Bad Things Happen to Good People? If you're just now joining us, this is week five, I believe. We did a Why Do Bad Things Happen to Joseph? Why Do Bad Things Happen Using Esther's Life? Why Do Bad Things Happen Using Ruth and Naomi? Last week, we looked at Paul and his entire journey as a Christian, why all those things happened to him. Tonight, we're looking at Jeremiah and the people of Israel using other scriptures. This is Bible study. I'm giving you multiple scriptures. If you're on TikTok, uh, our friends in TikTok are putting multiple, all the scriptures that I'm shouting tonight or, or sharing tonight, they're putting them in the chat. So here's what I'm going to pick up. We all know this scripture. Let me back up. Oh, yeah. Your, your trials are designed. They're on purpose. Everything you're going through, every everything you've experienced, God was the one in control. You have to believe that. You, you have to get to a point in your belief, in your faith, that no one can steal your blessing. No no one can, can rob you of what God has for you. That, that whatever the other person has, that's theirs. That, that was their promotion. That was their husband. That's their family. That, that's what God wanted them to have. Don't be deceived by the devil to make you think that you're missing out on something because you're not. That's a big fat lie. 
Everything that God promised you is for you. Maybe it's 70 years. Maybe it's 15 like Joseph. Maybe it's 14 like David. He's refining you. He's preparing you for eternity. Only the humble enter heaven. Only the humble receive robes of righteousness. If the character of humility and contentment is not reached in you, you will continue to feel like life's not fair. Why is things happening to me? I deserve better. Why do I get the short end of the stick? Why, why is it not one thing is something else? Until you get to a place of humility, write this down. This is good teaching tonight. You will always feel like you're missing out. You will always feel like somebody else has the upper hand. You will compare your life to other people and feel like God has let you down. You've let yourself down. You'll have regrets and grief and you'll be overwhelmed with the anxieties of life because you're comparing what somebody else has with what you have. And that's not the plan God had for you. You have to get to a place where you're lowly in spirit and you say, God, wherever. blessed are those who mourn. Matthew chapter five. They're the ones that get comforted. Not the prideful, not the people who go out and, and try to achieve everything in life, not the arrogant, not the ambitious. Those who mourn, those who say, you know what, you know what, it's not a big deal. They get comforted by God. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. We're back to this humble thing tonight. I dare to say this. I wrote this in my notes. This may be a, a, a good tweet. I dare to say that not one person who has not been broken who has not mourned their sin, not mourned their situation, who have not humbled themselves, they won't see heaven. I, I do not think that you can get to heaven if you've not mourned your sin, mourned your situation, lowered yourself, humbled yourself. Yeah, there's a confidence that we should have in Christ Jesus. I outrank the devil. No weapon formed against me can prosper. I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. But at the same time, as Paul mentioned, I enjoy the sufferings of Christ. I'm all right in my situation. I've learned to be content with a lot and a little, and I'm okay with a little. <sighs> it's part of the salvation package. Repentance we know about, surrendering we know about, putting Christ in our hearts we know about. We leave out that humble part. And again, I would dare to say that it's, it's a fallacy in modern day preaching because, and I'm not going to say any names, but a lot of the preachers aren't humble. A lot of the pastors aren't humble in their approach toward humanity, toward the very people that given to their ministries, they live a lifestyle that makes you wonder, do they understand even what they're, what this is about? This is about eternity. This is about saving souls, doing anything you can to help people reach Jesus. There's no pride that comes in preaching the gospel, zero. There's no celebrity, there's no fame in preaching the gospel. And there's some preachers that I truly enjoy, but I have to be careful even with them myself to not put them on a pedestal. They put their pants on just like me. They prepare their food just like me. They got to put gas in their car just like me. I want to be humble like Christ. Everybody knows this scripture. Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles 7.14. What's it say? If my people who are called by my name would what? What do they have to do? It's right here in the scripture this whole time. Everything about our suffering, everything about our trials, everything about what we've gone through, all the losses we've experienced, all the pain that we go through, all the, the dark moments that we've had, it's right here in the scripture. Humbleness. If they would humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I'll hear from heaven, I'll forgive their sins and heal their land. God had a unique plan for, for the people. Each, each person, each of you have a unique, distinct purpose for you. And, and in the building and the shaping, the chiseling that God is doing in your life, he just asks that you humble yourself. Let me give you some context of this scripture because it ties into Jeremiah. So as it was stated earlier, uh, the temple was destroyed. King Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the temple, took all of the Israelites to a distant land, Babylon. I explained to you that at some point they were going to go back and rebuild the temple. It was during Solomon's time uh, earlier in this story where he prayed to God and said, God, we just built this temple for you and we want your presence to dwell in the temple. If you would please honor us by coming and, and being a part of this temple that we created for you. We want you to dwell here. My dad couldn't do it. Dave couldn't build this temple because he had too much blood on his hands. We built this temple, Solomon said, and if you would come and, and be a part of what we built for you. And then God says what we just read in Chronicles. Okay, I, I'll come only if 
You humble yourself. Mm, Lord, a word of teaching that is tonight. God said, I will come in your situation. I will come in your physical temple. We are the temples of the Holy Ghost. I will come and visit you, rest on you, provide for you, comfort you, help you. But you got to humble yourself and pray. Hmm. All right, I'm almost done. Quit comparing yourself to other people. Quit comparing your life to other people's lives. Quit comparing what you have to what other people have. Quit comparing your sickness to other people's sickness. Quit comparing your circumstance to other people's circumstance. Yes, yes. Every preacher that we read tonight said the same thing that we've all said. Why do wicked people get to flourish? Why do people that look like they're doing wrong get the best things in life and all of us who are serving God get the short end of the stick? God says quit comparing your situation to people because what if God is up to something? What, what keeps you from this despair is how you see life. You got to understand Psalms 46 and 1 through 3. That God said, I will be your refuge, refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. He can't help you if you're not in trouble. He can't be by your side and, and, and give you the, the comfort you need if you're never in trouble. We don't want to be in trouble. We don't want the trials. We don't want the suffering. We don't want the pain. We don't want the loss. It's too much. It's too much. It's too much, God. Therefore, we do not fear Though the earth gives way and the mountains fall into the sea, I, I don't fear. Why don't I fear, David said? Because he's an ever-present help when I'm in trouble. Don't compare yourself to others. Some of you have been wanting to get married for a long time. Some of you wanted children. Some of you wanted a career. I'm going to keep hammering this because I believe this is what the Holy Spirit is leading us down this path. It's not about things. It's not about the prosperity of the world flashes at us. It's about a humble heart submissive to the will of God. Yeah, we'll get our own little pity party. Look at poor old me. Proverbs 3 and 31 says, Do not envy a man of violence. Do not choose any of his ways. Psalms 37 and 1. Do not fret because of evildoers. Do not be envious of people who do wrong. See, comparing yourself to other people can lead to some some sin in your life some 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 wickedness it can lead to a spirit of uh jealousy it can lead to making sure the music doesn't run out here thank you for your patience uh it can lead to a spirit of jealousy and envy the last thing you want to do is have an envious jealous spirit hovering over your home comparing yourself to others can give you a sense of being undervalued where you start not valuing the talents and the gifts that the Lord gave you. Don't compare yourself to other people. Comparing yourself to other people can lead to discouragement and disappointment and anxiety, depression, discontentment. Don't compare yourself to other people. Comparing yourself to other people can cause a spirit of judgment and criticism to come over you. Well, look at them over there. And you start mouthing, you start trying to share teeth. Don't compare yourself to other people. Your worth is not determined by what others have. Your worth is determined by who God said you are. Let me say that again. Your worth is not determined by what other people have and what you don't have. Your worth is determined by who God said you are. You know who he said you are? Child of the King, the righteousness of God, holy and beloved, set apart. Let's take a test. Give me, give me, give me, what time is it? 808. Give me 10 more minutes. I promise I'm going to try to be finished with this Bible study. Let's ask ourselves an honest question. This is a personal test. Do not put your answers in the, in the chat. This is between you and God. Let's take a test. Get a pen and pat, pencil out. And I want you to kind of tally on a paper or maybe in your phone, send a text message to yourself. Write it down somewhere. Here's the test. And again, don't answer out loud. Ask yourself this honest question and ask the Holy Spirit to guide you in your answers. What are some things that you want to be known for? Just stop for a moment. Be honest. I'm going to let this plane land. What, what do you want others to notice about you when they see you and meet you? What's the very first thing you want them to kind of check out? Is it your sense of humor? Your unique talents and skills? Maybe it's your creativity? Maybe it's a, a certain passion that you have for a hobby, like to build things or sew or what do you want people to know about you? What's the first thing you want them to see? Maybe it's your sense of style and how you dress and how you put your makeup on. 
Maybe it's you being debonair. Maybe it's your looks. You want them to notice your beauty, your figure, your intelligence. What do you want people to really notice about you when they meet you and you shake their hand? Number of degrees you have, your career, and how long you've been doing something. Like all my achievements and all my trophies and all my accomplishments. And oh, go check out my, my LinkedIn. Maybe it's your musical talent. I can sing better than most of the angels. I've been on this program and I sang for him and I did back up for this person. Maybe it's your athletic ability. Oh man, I can jump this high and I used to be a part of this and I'm faster than that person. What do you want people to know about you? What do you want them to know you for? What do you want to be known for? Maybe you're the person that can answer any question about pop culture. You can go into Jeopardy and, and win anything. Maybe you have a green thumb. You can grow anything in the garden and you're just so happy. You want people to know about that. Maybe you're the kind of person that's a DIY. I don't know. I'm giving you a list of things. I'm letting the Holy Spirit work on this. This is a personal test. Don't answer in the chat. What do you want to be noticed for? Maybe it's your communication skills. Maybe it's public speaking. What's the first thing you want people to know or notice when they check you out? Here's the test the Lord gave me as I took this test. It should be none of those things. Zero. If you're getting yourself together every day because you want somebody to notice something that's a, a, a tangible, that's neither here nor there, that will not carry into the, the next life, then yes, there's some humbling that needs to be done. There's some correction that has to take place. Uh, the first thing that you should possibly want people to notice is your empathy and compassion for humanity. Perhaps your patience, your love, your joy for the world. Maybe it's the thoughtfulness that you have for other people, your integrity, your honesty. That's, when people meet you or, or notice something, they should notice how positive you are, how optimistic you are, your resilience to face challenges and not give up. When people meet you and they, they see you for the first time or the second time or people talk about you, man, have you met so-and-so? Man, they sure are inspiring. She sure is motivating. Boy, she is a humble creature of God. Boy, she is spiritual. She is so faithful. Man, she is the kindest person I've ever met. Do you know that she is the most patient person I've ever, I've ever come across in my life? You know what I noticed about her? She's empathetic. She didn't talk about herself. She didn't bring up her issues. She is the most thoughtful person I've ever come across. That's what we should be known for. Don't covet. Don't compare yourself to other people. Don't try to get what other people have. So what? Use what God gave you. Be happy in the life that God has put you in. Philippians 4. This is still Bible study. I'm wrapping up. Philippians 4, 11 through 13. I'm not saying this because I'm in need. For I've learned to be content. Whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. And I've learned the secret to life. I've learned the secret to being content. In every trial. Every situation. Every loss. Every circumstance I've learned. Oh, this is this is a journey, huh? You, you learn what you learn, Paul. He said, "Whether I'm fed, whether I'm on an empty stomach, whether I have a lot of money in the bank, or I'm down to my last few pennies, I've learned this: that as long as I have Christ Jesus, I can make it. I I can do everything that He's given me the strength to do." I can wake up every morning and keep moving. I can continue being kind to people because he gives me the strength. I can wake up knowing that this is not my end because he strengthens me. Yeah, yeah. Second Corinthians 12, 9 and 10. But he said to me, Paul, my grace is all you need. It's sufficient. It's enough. You don't need anything else, Paul. It's sufficient. It suffices the situation. Because when you're weak, when you're humbled, when you're lowly, that's when I'm strong in your life. See, oh, this is good teaching, good teaching, good teaching. Don't be deceived by the, the, the envious men of the world who look like life is happening good for them. And they look strong. That's not strength. Having all the money in the bank and the perfect life is not strength. Having the, the perfect frame and the perfect look and the, the perfect set of kids, that's, that's not life. The Bible says that when you're weak, when you're willing to accept the frailties of what you have, your sickness, everything that God has given you, you're willing to accept that without change. If this is who I am, this is who I am. You'll be the strongest of them all. Ah, this is good. He said, I will not. He said, therefore, I will boast more gladly about my weaknesses 
Now we try to clean up all of our weaknesses. We try to perfect our weaknesses. We try to take those things that, that, that are, are not perfect, the hurt, the pain, the traumas, and we try to make it up as if it never happened. And God is saying, it's in that weakness that I can use you because I want to use you to help other people. Christ is more powerful in you when you're weak. Our problem is we don't want to be weak. Job said, even if you, you took me, you took my entire family, if you want to take me, I trust you. No, we say, no, 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 don't take me yet. Don't take me yet, Lord. Don't take me. Don't slay me. I still got some things I want to do. I hadn't lived my life yet. I hadn't been to Greece yet. I hadn't been to Africa. I hadn't started that business yet, Lord. I Don't, 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 don't de redirect my life, Lord. We got to get to a point where we say, Lord, I'm in your hands. <laughs> I mean, so here's what I'm going to close with. Here, here's what I, here's an illustration of what our lives sometimes feels like and seems like. I don't know if you can see this. So this is our life. You see that circle? No, you can't even see the circle because of the glare. Let me turn this off. And maybe the glare will go away. Yeah, maybe a little bit. Big old circle of what our lives look like. Maybe I'll do it that way. This is us. All of our struggles, all of our pain, everything we're going through, we believe our lives are made up of all of these intricate uh, circumstances and life scenarios, and we go through life. And our lives move along. And we th we think, we, we, we think that our lives continue on into the abyss and life happens forever. What if, what if life wasn't even what we think it is? What if life, see this small tip, what if all life really was that you went through was a small little dot right there? That's your entire life. And eternity are hundreds and hundreds and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and millions and millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of years into eternal life. My daughter drew this before she went to college. She just in here doodling one day. She would know that it turned out to be a part of this illustration. So you enter into eternal life. And everything that you experience in your 70, 80 years, this little dot does not even compare to all of the joy, all of the, the goodness, all of the holiness and righteousness that we experience the rest of our lives. I'm here to let you know, and I wish I could have illustrated that a little bit better, that what we go through is, is on purpose, is with purpose. God knows what he's doing. We can look at the lives of those before us in the Bible and get a clear understanding that this is this is part of his plan and he's preparing me. He's humbling me. He's, he's getting me to a place in my character where I truly am surrendered to his perfect will. And when it's all said and done, I, I can live with whatever the outcome will be because my, my end goal is eternity. My end goal is eternity. My end goal is eternity. I'm not, I don't, so what? Yeah, life happened. Things happened. Didn't go as, as I planned. People didn't live as long as I thought they should have. My, my body didn't act the way I wanted it to act. Guess what? It's temporary because there's something greater. That's the message. That's why things happen to us because God doesn't want us stuck on this life. That's the message. Things happen to us because God is constantly refining us. He's constantly chiseling away at our character. That's the message. That's the message. All right. I'm going way over my time. Way over my time. Jamie, thank you for jumping in over here. Uh, my phone completely died. I should have had it charged while we were doing this. Um, I'm going to have to send a message to all our friends on, on TikTok. Let me close with a word of prayer. I pray that this blessed you. I will upload this uh, for later playback uh, for those that didn't get to get the last few pieces here. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your holiness. We thank you for your word. I ask, Lord, that if you would continue to move in us, continue to give us the joy of knowing you, the joy of, of having 
the pleasure of suffering. Yeah, the, the joy of knowing that there's more to life than, than what's going on here. We have an, a new heaven and a new earth to look forward to. And that our temporary sufferings do not compare. Lord, thank you for giving us your joy, giving us hope, giving us a future. We thank you. We appreciate everything you've allowed in our lives because we know that there's good that's going to come out of it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Everyone said, hallelujah. All right, that's my time. Again, I apologize for everybody that was on uh, TikTok. I'm going to upload this on YouTube so you can catch that last 10 minutes or so. Uh, again, for those who join us for prayer in the morning, we'll see you in the morning at 6 a.m. Central on TikTok, uh, praying for our world, praying for those around us. Have a wonderful, wonderful. Yep, that's where I was getting at, Stacy. It's a, it's a it's the big picture. It's the big picture. Uh, I'm going to go back live here on TikTok. Hopefully a few people will jump on and I can finish up the message over there. But for everybody on Facebook, thank you. Sister Pippin, thanks for joining. Rasheen, thanks for joining. Sister Stacy and Jamie, Wanda Grant, all of my neighborhood audience, Sister Joy and Sister Pittman, Brother Glover, Donita, thank you guys. Thank you guys. God bless you. Have a wonderful evening. But again, thank you guys for for joining thank you our, our our bible study series was why do bad things happen to good people why do we suffer why do christians have to go through things why do good people have to go through life's issues and what we studied tonight was from the book of jeremiah jeremiah chapter 29 we didn't even get to jeremiah chapter 33 but what we learned in jeremiah uh i'm just recapping bible study is over now i'm just doing a recap i'm just doing an after show recap of what we studied and I'll, i'd love to take some q a i'd love to maybe even uh allow you the opportunity to, to join in here never done that either if, if you got a good word to share regarding uh why we suffer why we go through what we go through uh i'm open to that we suffer because god said it's part of his plan he's not surprised by what we go through in life he's intentional about the the, the steps that are ordered he doesn't make mistakes he doesn't sleep on our situation he doesn't take naps everything that ever happened to you everything i'm just recapping now i'm just recapping my phone died and i'm i'm just recapping at this point everything you've ever gone through is what we've been studying the last five weeks is intentional yeah that's that's the part that a lot of people miss that it's intentional god knows what he's doing he didn't make a mistake and when, when you can really put that in your heart and really accept that the depression goes away the anxiety goes away the, the, the mishandling of situations goes away because you know that God designed it. He loves you too much to make mistakes. He loves you too much to kind of let life happen to you. Everything that's ever happened to you, the devil had to get permission. He, he, had, he had to make sure that God was okay with it. God had to sign off on it. God had to give his stamp. God had to put his signature on it. Everything. Listen, that's that's the miss. That's where we miss it. We miss that piece of the teaching, the understanding that this was all God. Lost my job. It was God. He allowed it. my sickness in my body. That was God. He's up to something. What's happening in my family? All God. I'm not talking about the person who's sinning, the person who's wayward, the wicked. I'm talking about the Christians. I'm talking about all the Christians out there who, who keep asking that question. Why me? Why me? Why me? I'm just recapping. I'm just recapping. Why me? Why am I going through what I'm going through? Why am I dealing with all of this stuff? And if it's not one thing, it's something else. It always seems like I'm on the losing end of the stick. Always, always. Why? Why? You ask that question? Give me some comment. Give me some commentary. Give me some opinion. Why do you think you go through what you go through? We know what the Bible says now. We've done five weeks. If you're just now joining me, you go into my YouTube page, click the, the profile page here at the top. I have a little YouTube icon that will take you right to all the Bible studies we've done. And why do bad things happen to good people? God says, I love you too much to just let it be an accident. I have too much intelligence and control of life for, for you to think that your, your, your life is in a whirlwind. It's out of control. It's not out of control. It's in perfect control. It's in perfect. I just want to encourage you tonight. So it's just a recap. This Bible study that we just did, we did about an hour and 15 minutes before my phone died earlier. This entire 
Tonight's Bible study will be on YouTube probably within the next two or three hours. I'm going to have to merge it together, download it, and re-upload it on YouTube. God loves you. He loves you. Know that. Even in the pain, even in the misunderstanding, even in the decision making, he's right here. He loves you. He loves you too much. He loves you too much to make you feel like and think that this is this is just happenstance. Yeah. Yeah. Questions, comments. Jamie said to help us grow in the kingdom. To trust him and be humble. Yeah. That was the lesson tonight. Humble. I understand all you're saying, but feel like I'm missing something because I'm always misunderstood. As long as God understands you, I'm like you, Stacy. Stacy, I'm a, I'm probably more like you. I, I'm misunderstood often. But in that misunderstanding, I know that God understands me. And as long as me and God are good, I've gotten to a point in my walk. Listen to me when I say this. I've gotten to a point in my walk where I really, I really, let me be careful how I say this. I care what people perceive about me, but I don't care what people think about me. I, I really don't. I, if you want to misunderstand what I said, if you misunderstand my motives, my actions, if you don't get me, that's fine. Perhaps I wouldn't put on this planet for you to get me. There are other people that get me. There are other people that understand me. There are other people that absolutely uh, feel me, as they would say. I, but I'm also to a point in my life, I, I'm good. I'll sit at the house by myself, chill. Me and the wife, me and the kids. I'm good. Yeah, uh, or said he does when he when we hurt. Why not you? What do you mean by that, Aura? Just making sure I'm staying up with this. All right. Any other thoughts, com comments? I relate to your con your your combo. I think along the same lines. Praise God. People twist my good intentions to have something they are not and feel I have to explain myself. Yeah, people do a lot of projections. That's when we we pray for them. We put them in the hands of God and we say, at the end of the day, at the end of the day. Sounds like you got something that you're dealing with and I'm praying for you. You can twist my words all you want. I'm good. I'm good. All right. Any other thoughts or comments before we get out of here? I'm not going I'm not going to be here long. I was going to make sure a few more people that we missed out on got an opportunity to hear kind of this close. I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to give you back your evening. Ebony, thank you for coming back. Mary Lou, thank you for coming back. Stacy, Gracie, I want to thank you guys for, for being a part of this. Jamie, thanks for bringing mom tonight. I hope she enjoyed this. We're praying for her. And uh, I'll see you guys in the morning. Have a good rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you, Jamie, for sharing. I'll see y'all in the morning.